Book Club. Pierce Brown's here. We're going to dive straight into things. Iron Gold is the book that we're covering at the moment. As you know, every time we do uh, a Pierce Brown book, which can I just say, actually, this is a really funny thing. I've put it on you for some reason. It's not what it's supposed to be. Hi. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, it was. I, I live switch Pierce when I do these shows. I'm very clever. Um, I have given Maud's Book Club, the community, ample of chances to opt out of this series. We were going to do the first mm. book just to see what we thought. We're in. Love it. Like, hell yeah. This love is, it. This is love great. It. It's not, you're saying it's not pity moving this train. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And then <laughs> okay, the, the, the second book, I mean, I was like, guys, I'm so in. And they're like, you know, foaming at the mouth, ready for more. Morningstar, I was like, great finish. You know what, guys? We did the trilogy. If you want to opt out, No! And I was like, great, cool. They don't want to opt out of that I'm glad one. You're, I'm glad you're not. It's getting uh, gets a heartier meal as it goes on. Fuck. Because this one yeah, was a lot. You'll be more mad at, you'll be more mad at me uh, the next book. Oh, I feel like the next book that we do when we do the Q&A, it'll just be a therapy session. <laughs> it probably will be. It probably will be. Fortunately, Lightbringer is a therapy session. Okay. Book set. Okay. Yeah. So the, but no, the first one will be like, who hurt you? Well, let's unpack mm. that. Let's unpack all of those. Um, what is the number one kind of comment that you get from people as, as far as feedback goes with these books? Uh, who hurt you is pretty up there. Um, I also get asked uh, why a lot and then fill in the blank of the character who perished. Oh, yeah. And I've already done that too yeah, as well. Yeah, of course you get the inspiration questions, but uh, more so it's a uh, why did you kill this person and can you kill this person? Who do people want dead? You'll find out. <sighs> okay. Stay Did off you... of the Red Rising Reddit. I'll okay. just say that. Have you ever known me yeah. to be patient? Oh, you're getting out of frame. I'm out of frame? I'm going to do it live. Fuck it. We'll do you it want live. Me dead? No. You want me dead? I've already center? fixed it. I fixed it. I fixed it. I'm going to swivel chair, though. I'm a swivel So am I. Yeah. You're, uh, but you stay centered. Mm, you're trained and you're, grounded you're trained. Mm. i'm a i'm a deep library stacks uh, mole that comes up only like a couple times a year actually first question how's uh red god coming along it's good it's good um been writing it uh every day good work yeah well done mm. proud of you <laughs> i think i think i think it's uh i think it's a i think it's a pretty vicious uh finale personally well, because this is it. You have to tie everything up. Mm-hmm. And you say vicious as in? Well, you'll have to find out. Uh, but it's as if I've spent six books setting up all the pieces and now I get to smash them all together. G- gently. Hmm. <laughs> Good. Cool. Hey, uh, <laughs> we've got some comments coming in. Jay Bunt Rock, thank you so much for 19 months of resubscriptions. Really appreciate you. Uh, I just I, I said it to Pierce before we started, but I'll say it to everyone else. KP Dub said, PB and J. Pierce Brown and jokes. We love that. Uh KP Dub's also asked, hey Christian Pierce, where's your where's your Maud's Book Club merch? Oh. That hoodie. Well, have you have worn that hoodie again. ever? I've worn the hoodie. Okay, yeah, that's good. It smells like it smells like campfire and has a s'more stain on it. <laughs> good, that's exactly being properly it. used. Yeah, yeah, well done. Thank you for that one. Yeah, um, yeah, I'll wear it. Remind me next time. You know, uh, give me a little heads up because I like sure that we sweater. What did I yeah. call this one? The liter- yeah. literature professor call? Oh yeah, this is uh, this is uh, Pierce Brown goes and teaches at uh, uh, Wesleyan College for a year sweater. Yeah, we absolutely unpacked that sweater yeah, already. Yeah, yeah, literary uh, was it literary one hundred and one for freshmen? It, yes, it was. Um, Lisa says nothing happens gently in this series, Maud. That's so true. Mm-hmm. All right, mm-hmm. so um, as always, the community has weighed in. They have questions. I've got questions. Uh, right. The two questions that came, uh, circled my mind when reading this one, because we are, I mean, number one, if the first trilogy was a story of um, rebellion, um, a story of, uh, you know, trying to trying to buck the system, I feel like this book is a one-way ticket to consequences. Um, was your, you had so many variables, so many pieces to, to decide 10 years' time and include different points of views and whose those points of views would be. How did you land mm. on 10 years and how did you land on all the different characters that you decided to choose? A decade 
felt more important than saying seven years. It was a nice even number. But also, I think that uh, any of your readers will, if you think how different were you seven years ago, it's a bit different question than how were you 10 years ago. It's easier for us to measure time that way. And so I wanted these characters to be measuring their oh, – <laughs> my dog's trying Is to get Is that you? <laughs> um, yeah, hold on a Kitty. second. Kitty! Zelda? Oh, Zelda's already in the – Yeah, come on, baby. Thing. Hi, sweet girl. How dare you lock her out, by the way? <laughs> it's on I you. I thought they were entertaining her. And so it was a way of the characters being uh, introspective and uh, retrospective about their own lives – and 10 years felt like a consequential time period. Also, uh, 10 years of war um, seemed more in line with the, the Punic Wars and the classical wars, which I was trying to channel, instead of our modern wars, which can sometimes be faster and more like conflicts than wars that really shape civilizations. And so that was uh, how I decided the 10-year the, the metric. And then in choosing the characters, I wanted three characters who had different reasons to not think of Darrow as a hero. Mm. The first book trilogy is very archetypal. Now, in the trilogy, I do things that, uh, when, when, you know, I, I, read, I read and watch things kind of like a critic and have frustrations even when I love something. And so the first series is my attempt at... Uh, showing my version of the archetype, which I've seen, you know, the plucky rebellion overthrows the empire mm -hmm. in myriad forms. And, you know, Darrow, I, I brought up before how he's, he's different. He's uh, I said much less sympathetic in many ways than some main protagonists like Harry Potter and Luke Skywalker, you know, for instance, are easier to get behind. And Darrow, you know, perpetrates war crimes. And so that was my way of looking at that um, archetype of the, the plucky rebellion. And then I wanted to unpack uh, the repercussions of war and the repercussions of being hero to a cause. And being hero to a cause means that you have you know, quite a, a few people that hands. think you. Yeah, I think uh, quite a few people think of you as the devil. Mm. I mean, Morning Star, the, the third book, so the title was chosen because Morning Star, you know, the Bible refers to both Jesus and Lucifer. And so I wanted to uh, expound on that. Um, little inside joke to myself and really look at Darrow through the lenses of people whose lives were either directly affected, indirectly affected, or whose lives uh, by his actions or whose lives were affected by his myth. Larry is affected by his myth and his action to bring him up out of the mines, Lysander, by the fact that, you know, he, he took his throne, so to speak, and Ephraim because, you know, he had someone who loved that died for, the, died for Darrow, died for the cause. And each one was a different look at Darrow's character. And so the test of this series is seeing where they all fall at the end of it. Uh, Whether each, they're allies with him or enemies. Each one of them also had a different amount of, I guess, page time in the original books. Lysander, uh, you know, he had a big part of it where he was kidnapped by Mustang. Like he was, he, mm -hmm. he, he idolized Darrow, you know. That, like, so you had a really big understanding of who Lysander was. Uh, Ephraim was yeah. mentioned by name only. And mm -hmm. Lyria is completely new. Who was your favorite to write and who was your least favorite to write? Ephraim was my favorite because he's so contrarian and he's so funny and so jaded. And in a world where, you know, Darrow's inner monologue can sometimes be like it's torn from the pages of the Iliad and very self-pitying in many ways. Ephraim... Uh, he, Ephraim hates himself. Darrow doesn't hate himself. And a character that hates himself is very fun to write. Um, particularly because he looks at everything as some sort of sinister joke. Oh. And being so disassociative with um, everything going on around him and the repercussions of his actions. So he was probably the most fun. Plus it was fun getting to look inside the syndicate and the, the gray world and uh, the gray psyche. And then I'd say Lyria was probably my least favorite to write in this book. However, in Dark Age, she becomes one of my favorites to write. Mm. And then in Lightbringer, probably my favorite to write. Oh, interesting. Okay. All right. So where does well, she get started she, she with Lyria? To, yeah, she has to start in a place where she's mad, petty, doesn't see the scope of things, doesn't have the intimacy we have with Darrow, is the gnat in the path of the footsteps of giants. It's not a fun place to be, and it, it creates a lot of 
helplessness. Things happen to her. And uh, she feels like she has no agency. Ephraim constantly has agency in this book. So does uh, Lysander. So does Darrow. But Lyria doesn't have as much agency. Things happen to her. And her path is figuring out how to have agency. So writing this chapter in this section of her life is at time, was at times frustrating. Because mm. I wanted her to have agency, but I wanted her to earn it. Got it. You know? And that takes, that takes books to get there, I guess. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, you can have her start like Ray. Um, Ray, Ray, Ray Skywalker. Yeah, you never start like Ray, capable and good at a lot of things already, or you can grow the character. And I wanted to grow the character, even though it's not perhaps as rewarding initially. And for me, that's why she's evolved to one of my favorite characters right later on in the series. Okay. Jay Buntrock uh, in the comment has said, is Darrow a better gold than a red? Probably, yeah. Yeah, even as a red, he was, you know... If he's on your team, he's, he's great because he's scoring points. He's getting the, the laurel. He's getting your family's fed. You know, Gamma wasn't there. But in many ways, he's also an asshole. You know, he's very self-focused, very confident and overconfident. And those virtues are good as being a hell diver, but then they're quintessential for being a gold in their society. And I think that genetic, that, that, that psychological makeup that he has is better for a success in the gold world than perhaps being a red because you know in the red world there's a glass ceiling in the gold world there is no glass ceiling not really and so in that world he excels far more mm, yeah he's got more opportunity he's got more ways to flex his wings almost it's also a hell of a lot more fun being a gold and that's part of the fun thing about his character and um he likes being a god of war he, he enjoys it he enjoys parts of war you know other parts he despises and hates but you know, it's the the greatest canvas. Say, say this guy's a painter. It's the biggest canvas he can paint on with all the colors. It's the height of the emotional experience. He's being hailed it as, you know, a liberator and a warlord and sends, you know, screaming obsidians down on a planet. A um, little drunk on his own myth, I think, after 10 years of war. I, I feel like when you're so good at one thing and he's so good at war, it can come at a cost of being good at other things. Would yeah. you, would you yeah. say Darrow is a good dad? No. Not at all. No. There's a terrible father. <laughs> no, I don't know many I don't know many great men in history who have been proven to be good fathers. Look at Marcus Aurelius who expanded the bounds of the Roman Empire further than any Oh, now you want out? Who Marcus Aurelius expanded the bounds of the Roman Empire for oh, to the furthest extent waged countless uh, wars, not countless, but like, you know, three or four major wars, had tremendous success. And then figured out, you know, he was unhappy and, you know, became um, one of the chief writers of uh, Stoic theory in Marcus Aurelius' Meditations, which I'm sure some of your readers have read. And in Meditations, he seems like, you know, a very grounded man, who a man who could write these philosophical treatises. But he still left the empire then to Commodus, his like horribly vain son, you know, and forget Gladiator. Gladiator is not really accurate. But Commodus was a guy who fought 950 times in the arena. He was, um, he was, uh, you know, you know, what the heck are you doing? He was a glory hound, you know. He, but so he, this wise man, this big ruler, this great man, left his spoiled brat of a son the most powerful position in the world. Yeah. And so, you know, you can be a great. And history is replete with great men who are terrible husbands and terrible fathers. Mm. Is that was that kind of a little bit disheartening or disappointing to kind of see the arc of this man fall and fail so heavily at one thing that you know affects all of us because you know we've all got parents. I think so. I think so. But I think that it would feel how would I say from a reader's perspective, um, I considered that, and I knew that if it was still within the vein of the character that it would be disappointing but understandable but you would feel that he's let you down yeah not that he's betrayed you but he's let you down yes i'm not mad and again, again i'll cite star wars here you know with star wars um luke skywalker's iteration in the newer films felt more like a betrayal mm. because we can't see how the luke we knew would ever end up like that but being able to see darrow and how he ends up like this i think allows it to be disappointing but not a betrayal mm. um 
you can feel betrayed by certain actions and stuff, but from a character perspective, and I was really careful of walking that line because I wanted it to feel like a natural progression and disappointing in the way that, you know, say for instance, you're in a relationship, you love someone and they, they let you down, you know, and um, they can let you down in many ways that aren't like, that, that you knew were already coming. And in many ways you can see the writing on the wall with Darrow in his internal monologues and how he does lust for battle and how he does like power and how he does crave to be, you know, uh, attention and, and doesn't like, uh, even though he fights for democracy, he, <laughs> yeah. he is, he's, he's, uh, how would I say? He doesn't uh, like being confined by democracy. Because he lives in the world of war, which from efficiency's sake has to be run as a tyranny yeah. yet that's why you know in america it's so important that we have the separation of powers and the uh the civilians running the military as opposed to the generals running the military i mean that was the death of the roman republic republic was generals running the military and darrow didn't re remember enough of his history. Uh -huh. By the way, Claire Grant is in the chat and she says hi. What's up, Claire? Yeah, Claire's here. Uh, Claire's obviously uh, as into this series, we would message all the time, but she's been hitting you up about the book quite yeah, often in the Claire, reading I as owe, well. I owe, Claire a, I owe Claire a text, but I've instead been typing a space battle. So Yeah, Claire, Claire he's writing yeah, the last sorry. book. The last book. I'll encode my text in the space battle and you can read it then. Uh yeah. I'm still championing for a gold called Maud because it makes sense. You know, it's a little weird that you want to be a gold. How is that? Wait, you just said, and I'm, this is a live stream, so we can go back and clip the moment where you said, it's just better being a gold. It is. Yeah, it, it is. is. Yeah. <laughs> but, I think, but I think if life is, if, if a noble life is anything, it is struggle. What would you be? I said, if a noble life is anything, it is struggle. Yeah. So, what would you, know, you be? Gold, you what, know, what color? For struggle. What, what would I be? I'd be what, a violet. What color is Pierce Brown? I'd be a violet. I'd want to be carving. I want to be making griffins and manticores, pegasuses. You would be you a know, carver. Be so oh yeah. I feel like oh, yeah. Eo would have pink ears or something if that were the case. Well, I think there's like two different sides of us. Like my egoic side would want to be a gold, but I think we have to deny that side, and my true self would want to be a carver. So, uh, I like that. Um. I also have noticed in this book specifically because we are getting different points of views from some, someone other than a red and a gold, um, mm -hmm. you know, seeing Ephraim and the greys and we, you know, he has a red on his team. He's got a green on his team. We're kind of mm -hmm. learning about the different colors, but we've never really explored uh, this world through the lens of a yellow or a white even or a, um, a copper. Um, which out of all of the colors would you like to have explored more? Because I found myself in this book championing violets more. Like you say you're a violet, but it's like the only time it's mentioned was as a news broadcast. And I was like, go violets. Here's your place in the wall. Yeah, you've got, you've got legs. Unfortunately, the tempo sometimes doesn't allow, you know, and there's 14 colors. So every time I think about bringing in a new character, I'm just like, oh, God, do I have to add more to my roster? Because I have so mm -hmm. many characters as is. And so uh, a lot of times my editor will just be like, this is a great idea. But like, you know, you don't have to do equal color participation. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I would love to I would love to know a little bit more about the, the poor coppers because they get the, the they get the shitty end of the stick sometimes. So and I'd like to know more. So do the Browns. The Browns, you know, the Browns are fun because on the um on the rim they're in charge of horticulture and so what the carvers the violets have at the carvers the the browns have um uh, botanists that are called growers and the growers create hybrid or uh, hybrid uh, trees and hybrid uh, plant species in order to take it because the the the, the rim has much uh, poorer growing conditions for natural flora fauna of the core and so it necessitated the development of uh, specialty in the colors and the browns um, became for the rim, you know, of uh, crucial importance in securing their food and developing um, grain that could grow under um, different conditions than in the core. In fact, the, the their horticulture strip outstrips the, the 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 cores by you know more than 100 150 years of um, genetic splicing. Oh, wow. And it's one of the most coveted secrets. Yeah. So it's like little fun things like that that I get to explore 
with uh, this series as opposed to the other one. You don't find that out till that's not really put in until later. Mostly because of the tempo. I don't want to lose the tempo of the series. True. We do get a glimpse about sort of um, forging and, and blending different species of flowers to create almost like a, the, the floral weapon, the, mm-hmm. the death mm-hmm. awkward. So that's a, that's a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Yeah, the night lily. Yeah. Yes. For the Which assassins. was a, a, a joke at the time. My, uh, my, <laughs> joke, my girlfriend's name was Lily. <laughs> and uh she can be quite dangerous <laughs> so that's a little joke for her is that why is that why if, i think if you look at it, it oh this one's for the howlers but i think the next uh, book no, uh, dark, dark age. age for lily yeah yeah so i mean yeah i think when you're writing a book you have to you should probably dedicate it to your partner who put up with you i mean mm. you know not the most balanced person sometimes when i'm writing is eo gonna get the next one Eo got one in Lightbringer, yeah. Oh, uh, hold on. She sacrificed the most. <laughs> Let's check. So she gets a dedicate. Yeah, she gets a dedication. So that's to my two editors. Yes, it is. And then Eo's at the the acknowledgments in the back. Oh, got it. Okay, you want I'll out? get there. You want out? I'll get there. You guys second to do that. Uh, I will. There's my little girl. Hi, Zelda. Uh, we've got some questions in from the audience. We'll be going through these one at a time. Pow, pow, pow. Are you ready for your so- questions? <sighs> Yeah. Okay. First one, KP Dubs. Oh, wait. No, I'll do that one at the end, you cheeky thing. Uh, in Iron Gold, we now get the POVs from several other characters instead of just arrows. Did a need for other perspectives mold the creation of the characters or did you come up with the characters for the story and then decide which ones would provide the POVs? Or was there another process completely? I think we kind of touched over that. Yeah, I'll just answer briefly. I knew that I wanted different perspectives and I thought uh, what were some uh, foils for Dara? Great. Uh, Lysander is a foil because um, Darrow's kind of a physical creature. Lysander's a mental creature from the top. Darrow's from the bottom. Um, Lyria is different from Darrow because she's a woman in the mines, a girl in the mines, um, doesn't like that the mine um, life is over because she was a, she was Gamma and at the top as opposed to being of uh, Lambda Clan. And so his inverse there. Um, in fact, she had been a social better in the mines. Uh, and then there's uh, Ephraim. You know, who is the, the 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 debris left behind by someone who sacrificed his life for Daryl? So each one I wanted to be a foil. So they came about um, knowing that I wanted foils, and then finding which ones would probably be best fitted for Daryl in creating some sort of poetic inverse. Mm. Nice. City has a couple of questions here. Back in Morningstar, would Darrow um, have still destroyed the Ganymede dockyards if Roke had actually surrendered? Was there a scenario where Roke might have done so, perhaps if Mustang had been there instead of Victra? Would, Mus- get, would Mustang have tried to talk Darrow out of it? In no situation, I think, would have Roke surrendered. Mm. Um, no. Roman generals were famous for falling on their swords uh, after a horrific defeat. Going down for instance, with the ship. Yeah, for instance, when Hannibal invaded during the uh, Second Punic War and encircled um, the Roman, uh, you know, numerically superior Roman army at Lake Trasimene, surrounded all of them. Like, you know, in Game of Thrones, when they have that, uh, that ring around Jon Snow's forces and they're like just stabbing them all to death. Yes. Yeah, so that was drawn from um, uh, from uh, Roman battle. I think it was it wasn't Cana. It was yeah. It was I think it was Trasimene. But um, anyway, it was uh, so thousands and thousands were murdered and massacred, and the the ones the Roman legionaries that escaped um, were forever shamed, mm. and they actually showed back up um, in Rome and tried to offer their services to the Republic. And the Republic shunned them and said, you can never like bear arms for Rome again mm. um, because your shame is like, will you know, follow you the rest of your lives. So like, you don't go back, you don't go back to the society having lost. Uh, I do like the question. I mean, it's a bit of a what if because it didn't happen, but like if Victor wasn't there and it was Mustang instead, is that something that Darrow could have executed looking oh, Mustang in the eyes? Uh, he could have done it. Yeah. I don't know if she would have let him. Mm. I think that would have been a, big problem for them so she had extensive relationships with Mm -hmm. the rim as well Mm -hmm. yeah and she would have vouched for them in a way that daryl may have trusted her i don't know uh probably not because he was in his battle mode Mm -hmm. but i think it might have gotten even physical um with how much she would have wanted to stop it happening whoa how fascinating cool cool 
Um, yeah. Would it be possible to get some insight into how the Republic was created? How did they decide on the system that they were going to use? How was Mustang able to convince both the rising and the surviving gold senators after Morningstar to make these changes? So the difficulty was um, she walks in with Octavia's head, says she's a sovereign. And uh, during that period, there's uh, the gold senators play along to a degree. And the, the rising might have been able to get to Luna, might have been able to kill the sovereign. But her, you know, most of her fleet is still in orbit. And the Ash Lord's still there. And obviously he didn't die till the end of Iron Gold. Oh. And, and yeah, not a good death. And so the golds, the gold senators uh, basically were assessing the situation, to see whether or not, uh, which way the wind was blowing. And once they found out that the wind was not quite blowing in the Republic's favor, the way that um, the Republic thought or the way that Virginia thought, um, they, you know, abandoned her almost to um, a man. I think that like there might have been only like 10 senators left and the rest joined the gold war effort. And so uh, what basically then, you know, after that was about a four year or three year battle on Luna uh, in the block wars. And so the golds were not cooperative at all. They were basically, you know, seeing whether or not they had to play along and playing along until they didn't have to. And then very quickly, all in one night, kind of disappear altogether um, with the help of the Ash Lord. And so in order to... Um, Virginia wanted, um, how do I say it, proportionate representation, not equal, like, um, not proportionate representation. She wanted each color to have representatives, but she didn't want it to be, um, since there are so many more reds and so many more low colors, she didn't want it to be a tyranny of the majority. And so wanted there to be representatives of each, each color and then mm. chose two senators. Um, I was basing the two senator concept on, um, you know, kind of two Roman consuls. And um, also we have bolster bolstering out the numbers, uh, at least two main senators, but there's other senators that can be part of the the groups, you know, but there's two ones that are allowed to speak and then vote and et cetera. So anyway, uh, I looked at various representative democracies over time. I think they were going for something that was um, not uh, strict, strict democracy, kind of like uh, the United States, kind of like um, uh, French Revolution. Mm -hmm. And so those are some of the models, also the classic Roman model. But the Roman Senate was huge. Roman Senate was, some, was like sometimes over 700 people. And um, I didn't want it to be that kind. That I mean, that that thick with individuals. Yeah. Too many characters. You got to slim it down. <laughs> Too many characters. But um, yeah, so the representation from each party, uh, I also would knew it, uh, equal representation would also create a problem for um, how would I say it? internal tensions in the Republic because the, the Vox Populi, for instance, think, well, you know, we represent three colors, but represent 60 or 70 percent of the people. Yeah. And so why do we only get the same amount of votes as the whites or the uh, the coppers, which are less than you know 10 million people? Mm -hmm. And um, it's a fair argument. I mean, it's one that's being made today in a particular country. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I've got a couple from Colleen. Colleen says, Mustang makes a comment about Severo and Victor single-handedly populating the solar system or something to that effect. <laughs> it makes me wonder, is birth control a thing or do they just want a whole gaggle of kids? Oh, yeah, birth, con birth control is a thing. They just want a whole gaggle of kids. I think it makes a lot of sense when you think about it. Victor came from a very, un well, a family where, where love was more of a contract than uh, – a natural feeling and so very from coming from a very chilly family i think that she wanted to take the inverse path and i think severo wanted to be um i mean he he, he grew up um, with a father who was dedicated without a mother and a father who's dedicated to the war mm. and to the effort and he never knew that when he was a kid right so he he knew that his dad was emotionally distant and absent all the time. And he thought he was running around for his gold masters, for his gold patrons. And Severo had that wound for all of his life, not feeling loved and not feeling like he had parents. So I think it makes a lot of sense that he would want to be a father and want to provide that love that his dad um, wasn't able to provide to him. Yet at the same time, he did it in the middle of war. 
mm. which is part of the shearing forces that are pulling Savro apart. Mm. Um, I know that we're trying to b- bring class to this Q&A, but I've got to ask because you've made it crystal clear in this book. Mm. How does Severo still have um, an appendage to breed with? How has his dick not fallen off? Because his hygiene. Oh, Victor? It did not oh, his look, hygiene. His hygiene. Oh, Why does she want to come even close to it? Why? How are they? Well, because <laughs> well, she's uh, she's um, cleaned him up in some ways. Ah, you know, his, from his the navel are, down. <laughs> yeah, and his and his like you know his teeth and uh, you know his hygiene's generally better now. Yeah. No, he found steak yeah. in it from three days ago. <laughs> well, I, you know, you wouldn't even been looking the other in, in the past. I think I think I think well the thing is like uh, Victra I believe <laughs> likes Severo because he has no artifice. Mm-hmm. And and you know along with a superior intellect flawless physique I think she has uh, the ability to control um her sense of smell maybe she turns it off. It's, I mean like I worship Victra. I think she's fantastic. Uh-huh. That is the only questionable thing. That- there hey, is a, you know, people are into all sorts of stuff, Maud. She would come at him with a fire pose and just... I don't know. Okay. I don't know. You ever mm. been clubbing in Berlin? No. no. Victor would love it. <laughs> okay, fair. Okay, that paints the picture that I knew. Uh, Colleen also yeah. asked, did you choose SI for greens because of the spectral pop- properties of silicon? It has some yes. large green sp- spectral bands. I don't understand that question. So over to you for the Yes. Answer. Wow. Yes. That's it? Just yes? Cool. Yeah, that, no one's ever asked me that. Yes. Colleen Colleen is um, the grandmother of our book club, and she's very brilliant. She oh, it sounds teach, like it. She teaches my, us something my, every time. Well, Colleen's also my mother's name, so oh, yeah. she's ace, Colleen's ace is in my book. Yay! You hear that, Colleen? We got you. Uh, KP Dub says, why not F.E. for reds? <laughs> um, low colors don't get designations. Got it. Also, um, you know, I think the golds would uh, take issue with calling themselves iron golds and then the reds having the F.E. Got it. Got it. Which answers Tim's question. Are the middle names just honorifics? Is that why low colors like red and obsidian mm-hmm. don't have them? Great. Mm-hmm. Um, also, Stargirl reminds me that we don't kink shame here. <laughs> <laughs> okay exactly especially okay. not our queen victor okay um question here oh here we go speaking of the honorifics what are some other in color honorifics for green yellow copper silver um are there versions of okay. the stained rose peerless scarred carvers etc so honorifics uh i would not i would not count um rose stains growers stuff like that to be honorifics that's mm-hmm. more uh designation Mm-hmm. Um, usually having to do with specific breeding or growing up in a specific school after a specific breeding. Um, so for instance, like, you know, a certain house might develop a particular strain of breeding, uh, like obsidians, like the, the, the grimaces are, were renowned for breeding obsidians. And then they would sell the strain to, um, another family, mm-hmm. much the way people do horses. So for instance, you went, you have a horse that wins the Kentucky Derby, um, you're going to be rich, not because of the prize money. But because you can stud that horse out, mm. and you know the artificial the insemination of your mare with the horse can fetch from hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars, and so it's the same in the gold society. Um, so then for the honorific, you know the um, uh, you have CU uh, for coppers, uh, obviously, um, uh, ZE uh, for uh, the blues. Um, Gosh, this is really a quiz, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, well, there's some of them. Like, I'm sure you can find it in the Red Rising Wiki, all of them. Um, you have the. Um, yeah, guys, don't SN... make Pierce work for yeah. it. Look it up. Yeah, come on. <laughs> Help me out. Help me out. <laughs> you have T, titanium for grays. You know, I think um, try to find the fitting ones for each of them. Got it. There you go. Um, I sometimes forget all 14 colors. I'll be like going to my head, mm. like I'll be in a scene and I, and there's all these graphs online, which are great. And even pyramids and stuff like that and materials. And I'll just be in my head thinking like the characters I need or, or, uh, you know, uh, they'll, they'll be relevant to the part of the story. And I'm like, what are all the colors? Yeah. And 14. You, well, you can in your head. 
Yeah, 14, but they seem like far more numerous for some reason than, I don't know. And then you look at the pyramid, and I'm like, that's it? Huh. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Um, Will says, hey, if you could do it again, would you still choose these same characters for the different points of view? Or has there been like another mm-hmm. character that's just been kind of scratching at this? Oh, yeah. There, there's a bunch that I'd love to have in there. Um, you kind of try not to entertain thoughts of what I do it again because you do everything differently. Mm-hmm. Like if I reread Red Rising, it'd be like painful because I would change so many things. Got it. But th- yet those, those those decisions are you know what make it, and I think that's also uh, the fun of it in a way. Uh, there are some other characters I think that would have been great to have perspectives from. It would have been great to have perspective like? of someone on the rim, uh, someone on the rim, for instance, uh, like a low color of the rim, uh, perhaps a pink of the rim or a violet of the rim. But um, I, you know, and, and it'd always be interesting even just to have a gold of the rim, but it's already kind of gold heavy uh, yeah. material. And then if you go out to the rim, then you got to somehow tie it all in. Um, and the books just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And kind of the fun of these perspectives is that the, uh, the different POVs is that they interrelate. Like I wasn't setting out to do a Brandon Sanderson-esque sprawling fantasy book. Um, the pacing of those doesn't really work for me. I don't like how, um, I don't like uh, the sprawl sometimes of that. And so uh, I knew I'd be writing a different book if I decided to make those choices. And so I tried to keep it with people that had more of a um, a direct direct relationship with Daryl or would interact with uh, people that he knew or characters we knew in the storyline. It would be really fun to to see that rim perspective, for instance. Um, but at the same time, then I'd just be world building out there. Yeah. And while that is interesting and deep for the world, you got uh, focus. None of the character, yeah, none of the characters they would know would really come into play with Darrow. They would know of Darrow, and they'd be like growing up under his myth and seeing how his actions affected you, particularly the destruction of the dockyards and giving over the sons of Ares. But um, in the end, you just have – because I wanted I wanted five or six characters for this, um, extra ones. And uh, my editor, um, you know, basically uh, talked me off that ledge. Who are the five and six? Oh, gosh. It was so long ago. Um, there was a pink on the rim that I really wanted to do oh. named Ore. Uh-huh. Um, and there was – who's a heteri of House Ra. And – but then I, I thought that that would uh, – in order to be true to her story, I think her internal dialogue would have been um, really challenging, but also um, very depressing um, because sexual servitude. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it would have been very interesting. But I, I think about that one a lot. And then I probably like would have I would have loved it then like Diomedes Aura. Mm. But um, yeah, he's but fascinating. Problem, but he's like yeah, but the problem he's he's a lot like Cassius, isn't he? On a first, in a way. Um, in a way, uh, but unlike Cassius, he's been that way the whole the whole time, and that comes with a different set of problems. Cassius has often been the vain interpretation of that, and so I could not imagine two men who are more different yet united by that same thing, mm-hmm. and that would have been really fun to explore. Um, you weren't but, talk- you uh, weren't talking shit about my boy Cassius just now, were you? Uh, uh, you were. Cassius is well, yeah. You like you like the problems. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't have to, you don't have to out me so hard. Um, academic just said earlier when you were talking about different versions of this book, you know, uh, if you mm. could go back and make any particular changes, he says, wait, is Ragnar's death a core moment or is there a functional reality where Ragnar is alive? Oh, man. Yeah, no, there was there was a there was a version of Ragnar. You know, and uh, and packs were like bash bros together, but no Ragnar. That was always that was always gonna happen. <laughs> bash brothers yeah. from Mighty yeah. Ducks. Oh, from Mighty that Ducks. Would have no, that been was exactly so good. That was exactly what I wanted to do. <gasps> is happen to be bash brothers, and my way of doing that would have been them like in a hallway together, like um, they you know the the uh, they're clearing a hallway, and then they just basically use their bodies to clear it, and just smashing graves left and right, just kind of like body checks in Mighty Ducks. And then they chest bump at the end of it. <laughs> like, I had this whole ridiculous thing. But uh, the Pax's name got drawn out of the hat, so. Never happened. The but in here fu- it did. The fucking hat. The hat. See, the, I see what you've done. You've made it an inanimate object so it remains blameless. It's not me. 
<laughs> I can still find a way. Well, if the hat yeah. fits, you know. Mm. Okay. Uh, <laughs> academic says, oh, my God, D2, the Mighty Ducks and Bash Brothers. I crying love emoji. D2. D2 is so great. D2 is so great. That's, I, I, you know, maybe the maybe the gold came from that Scandinavian team or Iceland oh, team. Oh, yeah. yes. They I were superior. Oh, man, they were That's superior. True. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Do you have people after reading the book come to you and want to be sort of coined what color they are? Like I've got Jake yeah. Buntrock saying, I'm an editor. What would an editor be in the Red Rising universe? Well, you know, an editor would be what kind of editor? Like um, magazine or I thought it was art. video. Like, Is it a video? Video editor? editor? Jake Buntrock, what are you again? One moment, please. Yeah, video editor would probably be, uh, it depends if you're a create, like if, um, you know, if you, violet is often used in the enter- in the arts and entertainment, mm-hmm. but the greens usually are the ones who are in charge of like society, film and propaganda and holos and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So it'd probably be um, a green train who's trained in the violet academies. Oh, okay. Is it so weird? Yeah. Because you are absolutely a violet, like through and through. Ooh. And yet we, Me? yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh, literally poet, the man with the words. And yet we are going from points of views of people that are completely different walks of life from you. Mm. How was that? Is it like a sense that you, where do you pour yourself into these books? Who's representing what? you? Your uh, heart. Darrow, mind, so- Darrow, Darrow probably represents me the most. Um, that the, scares me as portal. your friend. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's all, they're all parts of you. You know, it's, um, they're also like uh, slivers of, of the way you understand things, you know, mm-hmm. just as I've never been a seven foot God of war. Um, I've never been a, you know, well, not uh, yet, not yet. Not I've yet. never been a, la- a last of the minds, a gamma who, um, uh, you know, is, 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 is probably as different from Darrow. Or is probably as more similar uh, similarities to Darrow than she does with me. Mm-hmm. So they're all like my impressions of things, but they're also not my viewpoints on things. I no. think it's, um, I think it's a uh, difficult. It's it, it's a it's a flawed conceit to imagine that the characters also are vessels for my opinion. Um, I'm exploring my, what I think through characters, mm-hmm. but I'm not like need, none of them are like a vessel for me. Mm-hmm. And so there's just it's my impressions of of how I think that that character would react. And I don't try to make myself that character and act like I'm that character. It's um, done a bit more from third person, I think. You're but, like, well, um, this is how you write a book. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, well, some well, some, some people think that they, you know, uh, like, uh, for instance, I, I kind of chuckle when actors uh, go all manic and do method acting. <laughs> Imagine if writers did method acting and they're actually coming up with the characters and putting words in their mouths and defining their faith, you know? And so it, to me, you do have to get in the head of the character, but you don't have to become them, you know? At least that's the way I think you create. Mm-hmm. City's so, like, well, not okay. until you said something. And Colleen says, not until now. <laughs> What's that? Well, the comment that you just made, they're all on mm-hmm. the same page with it. And KP, oh, yeah. KB Dubs is distracted by the three bottles of glue on the shelf. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> KB I'm Dubs, always wondering. Focus. I'm, no, no, I'm always wondering what kind of like weird incriminating thing I have behind me. <laughs> the glue. Yeah, yeah. Why? <laughs> no, it's, I, a, uh, it's a bookshelf. It's a bookshelf. Yeah. And a, a book, leather I, satchel. I, and the hat. The, the is that binding, the but... hat? Hanging on the back no. of the door? Okay. No, no, no. It's a Dodger cap. Uh, the hat, uh, unfortunately, I think I left it in a hotel room or lost it somewhere along the way. No. Yeah. So the no hat, one... it, it, it needed to perish. It was pretty gross. No one I ever can die it... again. It's in my hiking hat for like nine years. It was a little, a little smelly. I bet Severo loves it. And so does <laughs> Victor. Um, Victor would love it. It's uh, Victor Nip. Okay. Nick well, Nip. Mm-hmm. Yep, don't make that a thing. Uh, we've got yep, some more questions. Going back to um, things that happened further in the series, um, City, City says, hey, who did Mustang kill in the passage? Do you know? Why did the Proctors mm. pair her with that person? Yeah, uh, Sacrificial Lamb. Um, shit. I did write that way back when. Um, 
I wrote a scene where she was talking about that person and recounted their life. Unfortunately, that was like six, seven, eight years ago, and it's been lost in the mm. ether of my mind. Yeah. Got it. Uh, so, so it did happen. It was written. The person, it was a, it was a girl. Um, forget her name. Uh huh. All right. There's like full on questions here, like to go back into that moment. Like, when did she mm. realize that she would be forced to kill them? Um, I think as soon as she was in the room. Yeah, she's she's because she knows her people. Mm -hmm. Um, how did the event affect her character? I think she compartmentalized it. I think it scared her. Mm -hmm. Um, there's always in a in a reptile lurking within Victra because she knows her twin is the jackal. Yeah, and her father is Augustus, and so she's very wary and frightened about that uh, part of herself. And so I think she overcorrects in many ways. For instance, when my in my mind, one of the reasons she was so dead set on proving that you could win the Institute with a moral campaign was out of almost existential fear that you couldn't. Mm. And after having to kill someone to get out of the room, because if you know she can't affect any change if she doesn't leave the passage, after that she probably made a pact with herself saying one death. Mm. And after this, none. I'll be a force for moral good. Meanwhile, and Jackal ate that, kids. <laughs> yeah. He ate them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because she is not as at peace with the world they live in as he is because he sees nothing wrong with the world they live in. Um, she sees so much wrong with it, but is also practical enough to know that uh, you have to have the might to make the right. Mm-hmm. Mm, okay. But I think I think if, I think for instance, if it hadn't have bothered her so much, if she hadn't have been so dead set on being different than her father and her brother, then she would have been a much more dangerous adversary for Darrow, and probably would have uh, wiped the floor with House Mars. I think. Right. If you're just joining us, hello, welcome. It's Maud's Book Club. I'm interviewing Pierce Brown, the author of this book right here, Iron Gold. We are talking spoilers for everything Iron Gold. And anything that happens before that, we're not doing Dark Age. We're not doing uh, Lightbringer. We're going to keep it to this book and earlier. We will be covering those books for Moore's Book Club. So if you're into the series, <laughs> make sure you follow along with Moore's Book Club. Uh, I'm asking questions from the audience. If you are a Patreon member, you get access to the special doc where you can put in your question for Pierce and I ask it like this one. How developed was Ephraim's character when riding Morningstar? Did you already plan on him maybe being in Iron Gold when Trigg mentioned his skills with hacking at the beginning of Morningstar? Yeah, I, I planned on him being in Iron Gold. Uh, his character was more an impression than fully developed. I knew that he'd be different than Trigg. I wanted him to be a surprising pick because Trigg would be such a oh, he's such a crowd pleaser. Mm. He's fun. He's a farm, farm boy. I wanted a jaded city boy, you know. Who's the who's the one to meet? And you're like, these two are a couple. Yeah. And uh, yeah, one on one where you find out they were married, and you're thinking like, how? Why? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's so Why? good. I feel like though Ephraim. I mean, Trig brought out the goodness of Ephraim, and then when Trig died, he just circled despair. Like the grief exactly just consumed that. him, and then doubling exactly down. That with that medication that you've created, which suppresses emotion, which is quite interesting because that's in a way what antidepressants do. But it's done in a way where it's eating his stomach alive, basically, mm. isn't it? Like the... the Zolodone, yeah. Yeah, the Zolodone side effects include just like cramping of the stomach, but he would rather feel that sort of physical pain than the emotional duress that he's been under since the 10 years plus. In a way, that physical pain gives him something to fight. Mm. But it is interesting. Like, Ephraim should never have children. The way that he spoke to Pax <laughs> and Electra. <laughs> All right, hatchet face. You're like, <laughs> that is a Honestly, that was, that, was, that was probably my, some of my favorite scenes to write in the book. Like, like, she will be traumatized by that. This is a girl whose oh, looks are, like, going to be the most important <laughs> thing. And he's just bringing her down <laughs> you know maybe he's giving maybe he's giving her the the the, the humbling she needs i don't know she's 10, love, 12 maybe. she's 12 or something no she doesn't hey yeah she's uh she's privileged you know she's uh she's a gold 
So he's a little knocking down. Does that mean that when you are writing the fact that the Duke of Hands just smacks packs across the face, that moment mm. was very distressing. How was that sort of writing these incredibly difficult moments? Because for me, I'm like, we haven't really delved. I mean, we did. Eo was essentially a child at 16 when she died, but it's yeah. like, you know, yeah. child brutality. We know that this is what happens in war all the time, but to kind of see it so up front was <gasps> necessary. That pink's, been a se- that pink's been a sex toy to Golds his entire life. Right. You know, he's been, he's been an object. Um, it would be ridiculous to assume that he would have any problem slapping a gold child. Mm. Uh, finally, the power is in his advantage. What do people do when they've been stepped on their whole lives and then they have the power? Um, so it wasn't hard. It just meant it was, felt very obvious to me that it should be done. There's um, there's other moments that I think were were, were very difficult, but uh, that one uh, I don't recall being particularly harrowing. Mm, okay, because it just made sense. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah. Will here and said, being, and be, yeah, being being struck when you're a kid is by an adult is so startling. I haven't once. I still remember it. Yeah. Oh. Same. Oh, well, not once, but I still remember each one. Yeah, yeah, yeah that yeah. gets you. Um, oh, yeah. Will says, you, Pierce, are always very articulate and detailed when describing characters, whether talking about their actions or motivations or mindset. Are these thoughts you've developed after writing as you reflect on the books, or do you think deeply about these things as you're writing the scenes? Um, the Descriptors. Are 100%, they're 100%, they're 100% uh, there in the third draft. Uh-huh. In the first draft, I'm usually, uh, it's like I'm on a very high rock wall and I'm like reaching every, like in the dark and I'm reaching for hand grips. And then once I have one, I'm like, oh, okay, I, I got something. I can go a little higher, a little higher. But then like when I'm doing the third draft, the wall is illuminated and I know the path. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I'm putting hand grips on there. And so for me, the story finds full circularity and I understand which of these things, uh, which decisions and what the reason for everything is in that third draft. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say that when I'm first doing it and I'm trying a lot of things and that's different than a lot of writers do. You know, a lot of writers don't, um, they, they, they prefer the outlines. I prefer to try stuff um, and then see what resonates with me on the page. Three passes. But it's a really good question. Yeah, the mm-hmm. some of the thematic stuff, um, how to say it? Some of the thematic stuff gets uh, perhaps more refined uh, once I've written the next one in the series and the next one, because you, then you see where you are in the whole picture of things. Um, but that said, I'd say it's like 98%, 95% done when you've, when I'm doing that third draft, when I send it in, I'm like, these are the reasons, you know. Oh, the yeah. writing in this book, you could tell it was at another level again. It was really beautiful. And like the way you use metaphors and similes to describe things, I'm, yeah, I was just like blown Thank away. You. Yeah. Thank I was you. like, well done. Uh, I've only got about three more questions in four more minutes. So let's just power through these ones. Jay cool. Bunt Rock says, any chance there's going to be more print runs of Red Rising Sons of Aries? Uh, certainly hope so. I'll have to check with Dynamite, the publisher. Great, great. Uh, was there intentional symbolism in naming Romulus's mother Gaia, being as she was the one to set Lysander on his path when freeing him from his cell, or was she just named for Jupiter's moon? Uh, she was named for Jupiter's moon. Aha. Uh-huh. But, um, that, I like that retcon logic. We'll say that too. Oh, yes. got it. That was the third draft realization, yes. <laughs> When a reader, or sorry, when a first reader slash editor gives you feedback that you agree with, but that requires a substantive change to what you've written, how do you go about writing and incorporating that change? Um, it's well, the first it has to pass through the the the, the bullshit meter, you know. <laughs> um, are they giving me something because they don't know what I'm trying to do? Do oh. they disagree with what I'm trying to do? Um, and, uh, once I identify if they understand what I'm trying to do, uh, then try to see like, um, which is better, which paths better. And I'd say, I'd say sometimes, uh, if I reject it, I have to do it from a place of logic. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'll be like very, like almost pissed at a note because of how much work it takes, like actually pissed. Um, and I love my editors. They're some of my favorite people in my life. 
and I will hate them <laughs> um, and not say anything and just kind of process it and then kind of start looking at it or, go, you know, trying to do the thing I was going to do. Uh, if I really disagree, I'll tell them I disagree and that I'm going to try it my way. And sometimes I find out they were correct and other times <laughs> I convinced them I was correct. Okay. And yeah, and there's been things that um, we've disagreed on that one editor has liked and a different one um, uh, has liked. And so you just have to go with your gut. I mean, um, that's kind of why third drafts are like work for me is because it, it all has to get, just get to a Goldilocks place of yum yum. That's my test, you know? And so it has to be, am I setting up what I need to for the future? Um, about one of the big things I, I have a problem with is a lot of times they, they want me to like, oh, fuck, for what was it for dark age? Uh, basically I had to invert an entire storyline. Um, something that happened at the end had to happen earlier on and it required like a whole month worth of work and a whole bunch of like mental Tetris and was freaking awful. Um, yeah. And I had, I completely had to, yeah, I had to in, invert a storyline. And the problem is they all affect each other. <laughs> um, so yeah, they can be real big headaches sometimes, but you just have to uh, go with your gut uh, right. and go through your kind of thought process. All right. You win some, you lose some. Yeah. You go with your gut. Um, Vaden, outside of this book, when you read and evaluate a book, do you try to ascertain the author's goals and see if they accomplish them or do you just focus on your interpretation? Um, when I'm enjoying it, I'm focusing just on my interpretation. Um, you know, I think, and that's when I really like a story is when I'm just swept along. Mm -hmm. um, when I can't turn off the internal editor, um, that's difficult because I'll just disagree with what they're doing. And I'll usually know what, you know, authors know what the other authors are doing. Oh, really? Almost every, almost every time. You're like, yeah. I see what you're trying to do here. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, then I'll, and if, and if I see them doing it, um, and I'm not like cat, like really, really captured by a story, it's, um, it can rob some of the mystery and the majesty out of it. Yeah, because wow. you're just like, I know what you're trying to do, but I don't think you're doing it right. And so then it gets kind of like down to like, you know, someone's working on your motorcycle uh, and you're like, you're doing it wrong, and, yeah. you know, and the motorcycle may run, but you're doing it wrong, yeah. you know, and so it, some of it comes down to taste and stuff. It's uh, it's sometimes hard, hard to silence that inner critic, but the, the really great books, you know, like when you read something, you're like, yeah, I would have done it differently, but no notes, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and when you say no notes, that's like a big thing. And so like, if I like a movie I'll, or, a, or a book, I'll, I will, won't quibble with it or I won't say because it's such a thing in our heads to be like, mm, there's some things I didn't list like, but it was a good book. Yeah. I'll just say it's a good book because saying things I didn't like, the, the qualification feels like it's more to point out that I'm smart enough to dislike the whole thing and not right. to be converted completely. Instead of, I'll just say I like the book. You don't yuck yeah. someone's so, um, yum. No, I, I try not to. It's hard not to though because you know when you're a writer, you got into it because you wanted to tell stories differently. Mm. Got it. At least I did, you know, yeah. We got the last question from KP Dubs here. <clears throat> Hit me. What are the pros and cons of being friends with someone who runs an online book club? <laughs> um, free swag is a, is a pro. Yay. Um, <laughs> it's a nice way of staying connected to books that uh, I – especially when I'm writing the seventh, it's a nice way of remembering things mm. and keying in on the things that um, uh, fresh eyes are reading to the series. Cause a lot of, cause I can't go on, you know, I don't go, I, I can't, and you shouldn't uh, read reviews or go on Reddit or um, I, I try not to go on social media much at all, really. Um, and so my only interactions sometimes are these kind of group, these groups. And I find them to be really nice because it makes it very nostalgic and reminding you, uh, the journey the characters have been on and the, what you were doing in certain books. And it's also, from a standpoint of a creator, it's just really fun to get to see y'all enjoying something I created mm. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5 years ago. And knowing that it's all coming to a head. So it's kind of like Gatorade during a marathon, you know? And, <laughs> That's lovely. Yeah. Yeah, it's a Gatorade stop in the marathon. Gives me the electrolytes to power on through and also to remind myself to not lose the uh, DNA of the story. Uh 
because okay. the these these later four books are different from the first three. Yeah. Yet there's a reason for the difference, and then also a circularity that begins uh, that happens. And I think that the journey that uh, you're going on, just like being frustrated with Darrow or feeling like he's lost his way, these things are all intentional beats. Oh, and I weren't even now that I'm coming towards now I'm coming towards the seventh one. It feels so nice to see that the beats are landing. Got it. Got um, it. And I love that. The first, as I read this twice, I read it the first time to try and um, read as much of the series as possible before your light bringer tour to not have anything spoiled for me. Shocker, nothing was spoiled during your Q and A. Um, but I'd read it quite fast, and I was so angry at you for the treatment of Cassius mm. in this particular book. Mm. But I will notice that this, that this, I noticed the second read through, I was a lot more calm and patient because mm -hmm. I have hope that this isn't the end of him. But, like, you did him so dirty. Don't smirk. All for a reason. <laughs> okay. I think. You, you might disagree with the eventual reason, but um, that's that's the difficulty, too. Of, so these books came out, you know, with the two or three or four-year intervals in between them. And so, you know, the the last times I engaged in these kind of things some, is often the people had just read the book and they didn't know what was coming next. And they no. also didn't have the book next book waiting. And so oh, there was actual that been frustration. Horrible. Yeah, there was actual frustration and anger because Iron Gold, it's pretty disillusioning. Yeah. You know, what was all the victory what was all the victory for in the first three books, right? I my three um, words at the end of reading this is that it was all for naught. Darrow's trajectory. Um, everything that he was striving for, all for naught. And that is very depressing. I'm glad that was your feeling. I'm glad that was your feeling. Cool, cool. Um, cool, cool. My yeah, last because question. now I don't have to say, now I don't have to say like wait for like till I finish the book, you know. Yeah. And four years from now, you'll be so happy, you know. I, instead, I can be like, I'm so Please, you're on the journey. I know, and I'm literally holding it in my hand, which is great. And we are going to be covering this book and Lightbringer, but then mm, I have to just like stall it, <laughs> drag it out a little. Uh, yeah, the, the the con. I realize how inferior my uh, my camera setup is. No, my, I'm getting. We'll sort my, that, my dear friends. <laughs> yeah, well, I will sort yeah. that out. Um, I the, a question that I had ages ago, and this is my last one, but this is for me because yeah. there was time. There was a time jump here, and I my first question was why ten years. But I want to know, you were twenty two, twenty three, writing Red Rising. I was twenty two, yeah. Two, and Darrow was technically sixteen through all of that. Mm -hmm. With that time jump, how old were you when you were writing a thirty three year old Darrow? Um, I was twenty nine. Uh, when I so was you, writing the 33 year old. So you were four years older than him the first time you wrote it and then four years younger than him the second time you wrote that. Yeah. And I wanted to do that to give myself time to catch up. And so I am now 35 writing a 35 year old Tarot. That's cool. Yeah. Was that because there was a- in, hi in hindsight, in hindsight, maybe I should give myself an extra year because I'll, I'll be 36 soon. So I might have to speed things up chronologically in the books, but I wanted to end with, you know, me writing um, of the same age. Was there a time when you were the same age as Harry Potter reading those books? I was the same age as Harry Potter when uh, they uh, they came out. The whole series, like you aged alongside uh, him? Closely, closely. Yeah, I was uh, a senior in high school when uh, uh, the last book came out mm. and I found uh, my teacher gave me Harry Potter like gave me Harry Potter when I was in, um, I think when I was 11, maybe 12, 11, I think. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, and that, was, that, yeah. that was a really profound thing, reading as the same age as the character. I yeah, it meant I, a lot. I, meant, yeah. meant a lot, yeah. I, I'd be, on, I'd be like on summer vacation at my, my grandma's house, you know, with all the relatives around me and just reading like Harry Potter also being trapped in the muggle world, you know. Uh, in like the fourth third, fourth book, Goblet of Fire, I think. Yeah. And you know, my 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 aunt just being like, "Why don't you do something with your cousins?" And I'm like, "I fucking hate my cousins. <laughs> oh, they're muggles. <laughs> <laughs> they don't understand magic." <laughs> yeah, and so uh, I think it lent a lot to my experience, you know. And I think that Darrow's journey, um, uh, it's great that I get to grow up with him, and it's great because I, I I've grown philosophically and uh, learned a lot far learned quite a bit over the last years mm. and um hope, hopefully 
Get if you're plan. doing a seven book series over half man's, you know, like for over 15 years, hopefully your main character learns a lot too. Hmm. Um, just a little LA math for you, just to make you feel better. 35 in, as a man in LA, still 22. Oh, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 35 as a woman. Yeah. <laughs> 50. As a woman? As a woman? 50. <laughs> but everyone woman? was asking, uh, question for Pierce, what can Lisa you tell? Lisa will get Social Security soon. One day. Uh, Pierce hmm. says, uh, so, sorry, KP Dub says, question for Pierce, what can you tell Maud as she approaches her 30s? Uh, hold on to your 20s. Just buy the lie. <laughs> by the thank you so much for joining me for another amazing yeah. chat uh for the books if you... thanks you and thank you very much sorry if, if you want to continue reading the series with Maud's Book Club, all you have to do is follow along. You join the Discord. We do chapter breakdowns on Fable, which is a free app. Um, if you're a member, you get to vote when we're going to be adding that to the schedule for the next year as well. Vaden says, thank you, Pearson Maud. Wonderful interview. Academic says, hold on for dear life. KB Dub says, it's a trap. Uh, no Will says, thanks both. Blue Reader Girl says, great uh, stream. Thanks to everyone who's been watching. Appreciate that. Pierce, thank you for giving me your time again. Your camera thank looks you. great. Thank you. See you soon. Okay, bye.